there was a woman. She was a widow, don't know how long. She was also a mother. And like mothers everywhere, the first thing on her mind was how she was going to feed her child. An unexpected drought had brought famine. Food was running out. Water was scarce. People were starving to death. And on this particular day, she was out gathering wood uh, to build a fire so that she could bake um, the most tragic meal of all, um, one last small loaf of bread. And a man approached her while she was doing this and asked her a question. He said, uh, ma'am, would you, would you get me a drink? Could you get me a drink? Just, just a drink. And, and oh, if you please, while, while you're doing that, could you bring me just a piece of bread? That's an awkward moment, really. There's a famine on. Anybody that's local will know that. She didn't have extra. She didn't even have enough for herself and for her child. Now, in better times, of course, in better times, she would have generously offered um, whatever was needed. She would have brought the guy home. She would have cooked up a fabulous spread. She was a generous person. But right now, right now, in this circumstance, you've been in that kind of situation before. Hard economic times, lost a job. Something fell through that, that you weren't planning on. Unexpected expenses, a crisis emerges that's going to take all of your time and energy and money just to get through to the other side. And you're worried. You're worried about how you're going to make it and how you're going to meet all of your commitments and all your obstacles. And right in the middle of that, as if none of your life circumstances matter, someone walks up to you and asks for just a little more. Just a little more time or a little more money or a little more effort or a little more attention. And what do you say? And the story that I'm telling is found in uh, the book of 1 Kings, chapter 17. Take a moment um, to find it. You're going to need, it'll take a little while because your Bible doesn't naturally open to this part. Um, so 1 Kings, chapter 17. And the man in the story is the famous prophet Elijah. And the woman in the story is just an unnamed single mom uh, who is scraping to get by. So let's catch up with her and her response to this, to this question. 1 Kings, chapter 17 Let's start in verse 10. So Elijah got up and went to Zarephath. When he arrived at the city gate, there was a woman gathering wood. Elijah called her and said, please bring me a little water in a cup and let me drink. And as she went to get it, he called to her and said, and please bring me a piece of bread in your hands. And she said to him, as the Lord your God lives. That's basically swearing. Like, do you get that? Like, she's like, Gee, seriously? That's kind of what that means. As the Lord your God lives, I don't have anything baked. Only a handful of flour in the jar and a bit of oil in the jug. And just now, just now, thank you, I am gathering a couple of sticks in order to go prepare it for myself and my son so that we can eat it and die. So she's asked to give just a little. And the truth is, she doesn't have it. We've had these moments, yes. We've been in this kind of space where what we have just isn't enough to make it through and something happens in our life that demands a little more. Uh, Lynn Twist is an advocate for alleviating hunger and poverty worldwide. She's traveled the world. She's spent time in all kinds of cultures. She's written books. And in this one particular book that she's written called The Soul of Money, which I recommend to you, it's a challenging read. It will make you think about your life and how you engage what you have. She, she writes this interesting perspective. Listen, listen to this. I've been engaged for all these years in the lives and circumstances of people, many of whom live in crushing conditions where the lack of food, water, shelter, freedom, or opportunity drives every move, and every conversation. Others, by every reasonable measure, have bounty well beyond their needs. Yet surprisingly, in their world of overabundance, the conversation is still dominated by what they don't have and how they can get what they don't have. No matter who we are or what our circumstances, we swim in conversations about what there isn't enough of. For many of us, our first waking thought every day is, I didn't get enough sleep. Immediately followed by, geez, I don't have enough time. And whether that's true or not, the thought of not enough occurs to us automatically before we even think to question or examine it. 
We spend most of our hours, uh, most of the hours of our lives explaining or worrying about what we don't have enough of. We don't have enough time or enough rest or enough exercise or enough work. We don't have enough profits or enough power. And of course, we don't have enough money ever. Before our feet ever touch the floor, we are already inadequate. We're already behind. And by the time we go to bed at night, our minds race with a litany of what we didn't get, what we didn't get done that day. And we go to sleep burdened by those thoughts and wake up to that reverie of lack. Do you recognize yourself in that? I surely see me. I mean, if I can look objectively at my life and my emotional energy, much of the stress that I carry comes from my feelings about the things I think I need that I don't have. And you know, the thing is, it's not, it's not just an opinion. It is a fact. You know, we really do need an actual certain amount of money to pay the rent or the mortgage every month. And we really do need an actual certain amount of money to buy groceries, to feed our families. And sometimes the truth of the matter is there just isn't enough of what we need. That was the situation for this poor woman in Zarephath. She well and truly didn't have enough. And what's interesting about this story is that she and Elijah had two different perspectives on the same situation. You heard her response. I don't have enough to share. In, in fact, I really don't have enough for myself. I'm just going to make this last loaf of bread um, for my son and I so that we can die. I'm going to bake this last loaf of bread so that we can die is not enough in the most dire sense, both objectively speaking and in terms of attitude. It is the deepest you can be in the well of not enough. That Elijah saw things differently. Let's pick up in uh, chapter 17, verse 13. Then Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go do as you have said, but first make me a small loaf from it and bring it to me. Afterward, you may make some for yourself and for your son. For this is what... This is what the Lord God of Israel says. The flour jar will not become empty. The oil jug will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the surface of the land. First thing he says, don't be afraid. He spoke right to the heart of this motivation that we have. This thing in our hearts is at the foundation of every single time we live in the perspective of I don't have enough. It comes from fear. We're afraid. We're afraid that we won't have enough. We're afraid that we won't have enough to meet the needs of our family or our obligations. We're afraid of discomfort. We're afraid of pain. We're afraid of giving up something that we've grown accustomed to. We're afraid of looking stupid because we made a bad decision and now everyone will see. And we're afraid, I think, as Christians, many of us, that God won't come through. And if God doesn't come through in the way that we think he should, maybe that means there really isn't a God at all. And maybe that means we're alone. And maybe that means that the whole thing is a waste of time. You can really quickly start falling down the cliff of fear, afraid. And Elijah saw things differently. Elijah thought there was enough. Not just for him, but for the woman and for her son, and not just for today, but for every day until God changed the circumstances. And that's, that's what he told the woman. Now, she was sure there wasn't enough. And this crazy man standing in front of her who wanted something was telling her that there was. And she was standing in that moment and she had an opportunity to make a decision. And you have the same choice. Life circumstances are going to walk up to you if they haven't already and they're going to tap you on the shoulder and they're going to ask you for a little more time or a little more money or a little more attention or a little more energy. And you, in that moment, you get to decide, are you going to live like there's not enough? Or are you going to live like there is sufficient? Now, if this woman shook her head and walked home and baked that one final loaf of bread, this story wouldn't be in the Bible. She would have looked at what she could see with her eyes, what she could weigh and measure with her abilities, and she would have decided that there wasn't enough. And you want to know what's crazy? She would have been right. Her mindset that there wasn't enough guaranteed that for her, at least, there wouldn't be. But that's not what she did. She stood in this moment, this hard decision, and she made the crazy decision. She made the hard decision to trust this crazy old prophet and live like there was enough. Uh, Verse 15. So she proceeded to do according to the word of Elijah. 
Then the woman, Elijah, and her household ate for many days. The flour jar did not become empty. The oil jug did not run dry. According to the word of the Lord, he had spoken through Elijah. See, here's here's what happened. Uh, That's just so fascinating to me. By choosing to live like there was enough, by choosing the possibility that there was enough, she, she did something. She opened her life to the possibility of God doing something that was bigger than what she could see or expect. If she had decided there wasn't enough and had gone home and baked that loaf, she would not have ever seen what God wanted to do. Now, you're, you're wondering, maybe, you're sitting here and you're thinking to yourself, okay, I'm, I'm following the story, Mark. Not sure if it's meant to be, you know, guidance for us. Uh, is this positive mental attitude stuff? Is this a secret? Maybe after a year of studying Ephesians hard, Mark is just so tired of the Bible that we're going to go a little Oprah now. No, no, that's not it. That's not it, okay? That's not it. Elijah's view of the world in this passage wasn't a mind game. Elijah's view in this passage wasn't just about an attitude. Elijah's view that there was enough came from better information. Okay? So go go back to the text, chapter 17, back at the beginning before what we read, starting in verse 8. You see, Elijah was living in the same famine that the woman was living in. And God has a conversation with him and says uh, in verse 8, Then the word of the Lord came to him. Get up, go to Zarephath that belongs in Sidon and stay there. Look, I've commanded a woman who is a widow to provide for you there. You see, Elijah knew that there was enough because God had told him that there was enough. Elijah was living in the same famine, the same drought, the same circumstances. Just before this, he'd been living in a cave, having, you know, food delivered to him by birds. Uh, There wasn't enough food anywhere. God told him to go to this certain place and that he'd be provided for. God didn't tell him how. God said there, there was a woman that he'd commanded, but it's kind of a weird command if the woman on the other end doesn't even know that she was commanded to be commanded to do a thing. Like when Elijah came up, she wasn't like, oh, hey, you're the guy God was talking about. No. She'd not heard God at all. And so God says to Elijah, go to Zarephath, you're going to be taken care of. Doesn't explain how, doesn't explain why, just says there's going to be enough. And so Elijah went, Elijah trusted, and Elijah did the very hard thing. I am very content saying that I trust God. I'm very content saying that I believe that God has the capacity to do things in my life and in the world. Elijah did the hardest thing. He made the ask. He made the stupid, bold ask of asking for bread in a town that was starving. Right? Like the marketer, fundraiser person to me would look at that and go, you know, that's not really a good town for our program. You know, we probably shouldn't be making our fundraising requests there. They're not going to be available for that because I'm looking at what I can see, what I can weigh, what I can measure. And so Elijah trusts what God said. He goes where God said to go, and he does the stupid thing of making this bold ask for bread in a town that's starving. Elijah's view that there was enough came from Elijah's trust that God was going to keep up his promise. That was it. It was rooted in faith. Today we are starting a five-week series, A Generous Life. And we're going to talk about how we choose generosity in every aspect of our lives. Not just giving stuff or money, but in our relationships, in the words that we choose, in the way we interact with people around us, people that we disagree with, in, in how we spend our time. We're going to talk about how choosing generosity actually shapes our heart and impacts our faith, that generosity and faith are deeply connected. But as we get started in this series, we need to just take a moment and do a little self-evaluation. See, the story in this uh, Bible story, it presents these two perspectives, these two mindsets. The widow was living in this perspective that there was not enough. And that perspective was based very reasonably on what she could see around her. And that mindset, based reasonably on what she could see, was leading her down the path of starvation and death. That's where that mindset was taking her. It was based on what she could see. It was based on evidence. It was based on facts. And that mindset was taking her to death. Elijah was living in a different perspective. He was living in a perspective that there was sufficient And his mindset was not based on what he could see. His mindset was based on his trust in God and what God had said. And that mindset that doesn't seem reasonable carried Elijah and this woman and her family right into a miracle. Now, here's the thing. 
every one of us lives predominantly from one of these two places. Right? It's, it's wired into us. It's from our stories. It's from how we were raised. It's from how, whether our needs were met as children. It's from experiences that we've had in our lives and whether we grew up poor or whether we grew up with enough. All that stuff is hardwired in there to, to give us this emotional center of what we're comfortable with. And we live out of that all the time. Every decision is run through this filter. Two places. That there is not enough. Sometimes that's called scarcity. Or that there is sufficient. Sometimes that's called abundance. And so much of your day emerges from this mindset. How you relate to money, what you believe about money, how you relate to your time and your to-do list comes from how you feel about this. How you participate here at Bird City, how you give and serve and get involved, it comes from this mindset. How we interact with our families when you get home at the end of a long work day comes from this mindset. How we interact with people out in the world when we are having conversations out in the world comes from this mindset. How we relate to people that we disagree with, people who are different than us, people who have wrong or bad theology, all that stuff comes from this core mindset. Every one of these decisions is shaped by our gut level of generosity. And our level of generosity comes from this perspective that we hold deep in our hearts. Either there is not enough and God is not trustworthy, or there is sufficient and God is trustworthy. And we struggle between those two places. So my friend Jackie Kenmer is here today, and she's going to come up and she's going to talk with us a little bit about this. She has a great story that I want you to hear. Come on up, Jackie. Let's, we, still want, we still want to use the mic because we're recording. So, yeah. All right, there we go. Thank you, Ken. Okay, Good Jackie, morning. thank you so much. Now, you have spent a lot of time thinking about scarcity, sufficiency. How do you think this mindset impacts our lives? Uh, it, it impacts everything because um, this way of thinking affects, this is my word, our beingness and how we show up day to day and moment to moment. Um, I, I, I just want to say, can I say one thing about yeah. what you were just saying? Yeah. I love how God stretches us to the brink. He doesn't, go to a, he doesn't send Elijah to a family that has provisions or just a little bit and a man who's earning yeah. you know, things in the Jewish culture back then. It was important that there was a provider in the family, and it was a widow. It was the, it was the most extreme circumstance right. to challenge our faith. And so for me... I just, I think it's beautiful. He loves us so much that he takes us kind of to the edge of our faith. Um, but yeah, it's, it's sourced in fear, the scarcity part. It's just, when I'm in fear, I'm always worried that I'm not going to have what I need. I'm always worried right. that I'm not going to be enough as a person. I'm worried about what I'm going to say, or how's it going to appear to people, or sh how am I going to show up in this situation? Am I smart enough? Am I good enough? I mean, it's in my core, but it's also in, in how I see the world. And when I'm living from faith, it's a whole different party. It's like there's joy and there's peace and there's this fulfillment that it's all good. It's all taken care of and I'm enough. Mm -hmm. So it's a battle, I think, between two minds almost in our... Right, and, and so being. much of everything that we do every day is coming out of this place, mm -hmm. right? So you've seen this principle lived out in a really concrete way. This is not abstract theory. This is something you've seen really concrete in your family. Can you share that? <laughs> yes. I may get in trouble, but I'm okay with that. Um, when Billy and I got married, Kaylin, our daughter, had this thing with pancakes. Now, Billy makes Swedish pancakes that his grandfather made from Sweden, and it's a pretty exciting thing when he starts getting all the, all the ingredients out, and the kids kind of start salivating in their own way, and they're like, you know, amped up. But Kaylin especially would get excited, and no sooner than these hot, steamy, delicious pancakes would show up on the table, She'd be sitting at the table, like we haven't even gathered yet, and she's there, and she's already kind of like, she's kind of touching them, and she wants to pull a few on her plate, and she's kind of looking around nervously like, you know, where is everybody? And we're still gathering to the table, and she's already got them loaded, and she's got the butter out and the syrup, and she is just piling on the whipped cream like nobody's business, because if she doesn't, she may not get enough of her portion or what she wants. Like, she was afraid she was going to miss out on pancakes if she waited for everybody. And this just drove her. It was crazy. Like, we'd see it every time we sat down for pancakes. It was nuts. And we could see it showing up in other places. Say a little bit about that. How is it, this um, feeling showing up? Well, if we all get in the car to go somewhere, 
She's got to have a certain seat, like it's her seat, and she's got to go have it. And she's anxious, and she'll be in the car first to make sure she has that seat. Or if we would pull out ice cream for dessert, she was really nervous about how much was in the container. And if she, she would choose the biggest one, like none of us would do that in the room. We wouldn't choose the largest serving of dessert. Um, but it was important to her. Like she, she was worried there wouldn't be enough. And she'd check, we'd be scooping it, and she's checking the container like, what if I want seconds? I don't know if there's enough in there. And she'd get kind of squirmy and anxious. But it would really create almost this fear in her. It was, it was fascinating to watch it unfold. So did anything happen if, if, in fact, there wasn't enough? How did she respond well, to that? She'd just get really panicky. And, I mean, it's kind of like, um, kind of like just a little internal breakdown almost. Like her world is coming apart over a pancake. Okay. Or over something. Yeah, she so, felt very out of control. So what... What happened? How did, how did you guys deal with this? First, we were like, what, what's going on, man? These are pancakes. But we ended up having just conversations at the table. So when we would see this, this uh, way of thinking show up, we'd just say, hey, what's going on right now? Let's just all stop. We're just going to stop for a second. We're not going to touch pancakes. <laughs> we're, not gonna, we're just going to sit for a minute. And what's going on with you guys? Like, what's going on, Kaylin? What's happening? Because my kids would react, too. They'd mm -hmm. be like, why is she taking all the pancakes? You know, they have their own showing up of not enough. Uh -huh. And so we just have a conversation and say, what's going on inside? What are you feeling right now? And, and we would talk to her about how, you know, if we run out of pancakes, like everyone's going to get some. And if we run out, we can always make some more, like some simple concepts that we're going to have enough. We're going to make sure everybody gets enough. And just just speaking into that space with her to help alleviate her fears. And it's taken a few years, but there's been amazing amounts of shifts. Talk about that. What's, what okay. is it? How is it different now? What it looks like now when Billy makes pancakes is everyone salivates and gets excited like before. And Kaylin actually starts setting the table. She gets everything ready. She's very peaceful. The pancakes come out. And Kaylin will go and get everybody and, and make sure that everyone's at the table before we eat. And she's totally joyful. And, like, her whole demeanor is, is not like this fiery, greedy, take, take, take kind of thing. It's, it's very, it's abundant. Mm -hmm. And she wants to share what's there. And she's not worried about it. She doesn't grab all the pancakes. She doesn't take all the whipped cream. She's, she's just happy to share it with everybody and be in the experience. It's huge. So going through this, how, how does it impact you and how, how, is it, how does it shape your thinking? I know the, the one of the most difficult parts of being a parent is when I'll notice stuff about my kids and then if I let myself sit with it, then I'll actually see myself in it and be like, Ugh, and not want to have that conversation with myself. Yeah, I have that same problem. <laughs> No, I am the girl at the table with the pancakes in many places in my life. Mm. I can see it showing up in different ways, and I can see the battle. And what happens for me when I see that coming up, regardless of the situation, what I do personally is I, I put on this, um, like I'm my own detective, and I'm going to investigate what's going on inside of me, and it kind of happens naturally now. It's, it's just something that becomes automatic when I notice I'm... I'm fearful or I notice I'm feeling stressed, I stop and I say, okay, what's going on? Why am I feeling like this? What's the reality of the situation? What's my mind telling me and my fears? And try to discover what those things are and, and switch it up and choose to see what's good in my life and what I have. Mm -hmm. I'm not perfect at it, but it's, yeah. it's definitely a helpful tool in becoming aware because awareness is the key. And right. so much of this stuff is automatic. I mean, she just saw pancakes. She wasn't thinking about how am I showing up at the table and, and right. oh, I'm feeling fearful and greedy. I mean, she was just pancakes. That's all she could see. Right. And I get like that too. But it's so interesting that in that little environment at the table, when one person was operating out of that space, what it created for everyone else at the table. Like everyone else at the table started to get that way too. Like, oh, what, oh, what, no, oh, no. what do you mean? Like, yeah, I was you know. worried. I was worried about the whipped cream. I was like, okay, do we have two cans? What do we got going on here? Because <laughs> right. I didn't know if there's going to be whipped cream. Right, and so we experience, yeah, yeah. we experience that in each other, and then we react to it, and then it creates this whole, this a whole, ex like, yeah. like we actually didn't have enough at breakfast. Oh, my goodness, you know? Yeah. And it comes out of just this one person um, living one way. And then when you shift it, look at the story now. Like, everyone's enjoying the yeah, space it's really and coming to it. It's a totally different experience. Yeah. It's a good thing. Do we cover everything that you wanted to say about this? Yeah, I think so. Thank you so much for coming yeah, and sharing. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank Can we you. thank Jackie?
We talk a lot in church world about the importance of faith. And that's a tough conversation because faith is a very squishy word, right? It's hard to get our head around exactly what are we talking about. Are we talking about a, 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 kind, a certain kind of belief? Are we talking about a certain belief in certain things like a certain doctrine? Are we talking about like a really earnest feeling, like a really intense earnestness that I have behind my beliefs? Are we talking, what are we talking about when we say faith? It gets really fuzzy out here. Here, don't be confused, okay, about, about what that is. The single best way to start making sense of your faith is to just simply look at how you're living. That's it. Look at how you live, and that tells you more accurately than anything at what level of maturity and depth and experience your faith is. Think about our lives as followers of Jesus. We're called to live like Jesus. Remember that whole apprenticeship thing that we spent a lot of time talking about? We're called to learn how to live, how to do life from Jesus. And one of the things that's notable about Jesus is that Jesus was this very generous person. Generous in the sense of giving. You know, he gave time and attention. He used his gifts to bless and serve people. But generous in his attitude. Generous in how he engaged people who were his critics. Generous in how he spoke to people that disagreed with him. And that generosity went all the way, all the way uh, past inconvenience uh, up, up to the cross. Right? A generosity of giving his own life for us. And that's, that's what we're called to. And then there's the first followers of Jesus. The first ones. Way, way back in the beginning of the first century, in the second century, you know, before Constantine, before the church became an institution and had something to protect, way back before that, those first followers of Jesus, they were known for lots of things. They were known for being a, a splinter group of Judaism. They were known for... Uh, kind of being nonconformists who weren't willing to live by what culture said they should do. They were known as being a haven for slaves and women. We talked about that. Uh, they were known uh, above all of that, though, for being generous. They were known in the community, in non-religious secular literature from the first century, they were known as people who gave what they had to take care of others. They were known as people who, who risked their own health to take care of people who were sick. They were known as people that you could take advantage of in a transaction because they were so generous. They were generous because Jesus was generous. They were generous because faith leads to generosity. They were generous because they trusted God's word that there was enough. Okay, fast forward to America 2014. Ask a random person on the street what Christians are known for. I will bet you $100 right now that the answer is not generosity. I want to change that. I want to change that for me and for you and for Bridge City. And so this next month, we're going to be studying and talking about generosity. We're going to be looking at what it means biblically. We're going to look at how you can choose generosity. How generosity is not just giving some when you have a lot. We're going to talk about how you can actually impact your own faith and your own experience of your life by entering into a more generous place. And we're not going to just talk about it. We're going to explore some things, doable things, things we can try as individuals and maybe even as a church to put us into a more generous space. We serve an abundant, generous God. This is over and over and over through the scriptures. God is more than enough. God has for you more than enough. We follow Jesus, who generously gave his life for us. And there's this, this funny connection, this chicken and the egg connection in our spiritual life. You see, the deeper our faith goes, the more generous we become. And the more generous we choose to be, the deeper and stronger our faith becomes. Pray my words, pray on to your